Good morning, uh, buenos dias, uh, good afternoon, and buenas tardes, and warm, warm welcome to everyone to the launch of Costa Rica's adoption of the Inner Development Goals as a framework for accelerating the work with the Sustainable Development Goals. Costa Rica is the first country to adopt this framework, and we are very excited about this launch. We hope that this will be a, one country in the long row of countries that will adopt the IDGs. My name is Osa Jarskog, and I am responsible for global outreach in the IDG work. And speaking of global outreach, we have people joining us today from Costa Rica, of course, we're soon gonna move over there, from Sweden, where I am currently, from various countries in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, of course, and in Asia. And I would like all of you to write in the chat your name, the organization that you represent, as well as the country you're from. So please write that in the chat. And meanwhile, I want to share something with you. I want to share a very important number with you. And do you know what this number means? This number is the number of days that we have left to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the number of days before 2030. So we have to make every day count and we have to make today count. Some of you know about in the in the development goals already and some of you don't. But what you all know is what the sustainable development goals are. So please reflect on what capacity you think is the most important for human beings to be able to reach the sustainable development goals. And please write that in the chat now. And we will save this chat for later. And some of you who know the IDGs can write which IDG you think is the most important to reach the sustainable development goals. Very good. Um, one more thing for protocol or for practical information is that we are going to have the questions at the end of this uh, session, to all speakers, except for one speaker that cannot stay until the end. And that is Mrs. Ulrika Modir from the, who is the UNADG. So her questions, you can, you can always put your questions in the chat and we will make sure that somebody picks up the questions that we have time to answer at the end. Wonderful, having said all that, uh, let's move to where the, the action is. Uh, over to you, Jan. Jan Hendriksson, who is now in uh, Costa Rica with the team there. And with yes. you, you have Roberto, uh, who is Roberto Morales, who is Development Analyst at the Ministry of Planning, which is the host of the IDGs in Costa Rica. Over to you, Roberto. Thank you, thank you, Asa. I'm really happy to, to welcome you to this historical event. Costa Rica will be the first country in the world to officially commit to and implement the Inner Development Framework. We have an history of bravery and caring about people and the environment, and not just for the economical growth or geopolitical. Therefore, I feel very proud and honored to introduce and open this conference and present Jan from IDG, who will give us his presentation and his insight about what IDGs mean. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. And the CEO of the... We lost your sound, Rosa, but I hope you can hear me. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. So honored to be here. Thank you, Roberto, for welcoming me to your beautiful country. Uh, and this is a happy day. This is a day that brings me hope. And I hope you can feel hopeful that 
when we start something and we really believe in something and share values and vision that we can accomplish big things together as humanity. We have big challenges ahead of us, but today I think it's a, it's a day of hope. What I would like to say is that the Inner Development Goals is a rare framework. And why it's rare is because it's co-created but more, more than a thousand people from all over the world and it's experts like Amy Edmondson from Harvard, Bob Keegan, Otto Scharmer, Peter Senge from MIT that are here with us today, and many, many others from Karolinska Institute, Stockholm School of Economics, who have deep knowledge in the human development and in sustainability. But it's not only the researchers, it's also the practitioners, the actual companies and organizations and NGOs facing these challenges every day and trying to make things work better. They have been part of the co-creation process and more and more now the public sector is finding this and asking the question, how can we work with this? How can we contribute and how can we implement? The IDGs has co-creation at its core. And when we created the framework, it took us more than a year. We found five categories of human growth that can help us accelerate towards the sustainable development goals. You can find the framework online, but it is about our being and our relationship to ourselves, how we can get deeper in touch, be present and have our inner compass. It's also about expanding our thinking and not just being linear, but more systemic and holistic. Seeing the complexity, collaborating and bringing together more perspectives and getting better at long-term orientation and visioning. And we can train this. We know this because we have science behind this. The third one is our capacity to relate and not only to other humans, but how we relate to nature, how we relate to animals. And it makes me so happy to see how some of the policies in Costa Rica are so progressive so forward thinking on the relating side where we can get inspired in the Nordics and many other countries already. And to see that you're taking this even a step further now. Of course, the collaborating, and this is what we're doing now, we're here to see if we can inspire more nations, more leaders to collaborate with us. And we both need trust to trust each other and dare to buy a ticket to Costa Rica and to show up here and collaborate with these beautiful people and projects. And of course, the skills to communicate and co-create together. But least and not last, we need action. We need courage. We need dedication. We need optimism and creativity to do this. So I want to finish with three remarks that I would like to leave you with. And that's the three levels where I think that most progress can happen now. The first level in the IDGs and in the manifesto and the letter of intent that will be signed today, uh, you will find the societal level. On a societal level, we need to view personal development as not something that is nice to have, but something that is truly needed for us to create a sustainable world. Many people today view personal development as once you have everything else, you can have it as a hobby. It's a very dangerous idea to think like that. Human growth needs to be at the core of our societies if we are to solve the complex problems we're facing. The second level is at the level of organizations. And here, we cannot continue to just developing some leaders or talents in our organizations. Leadership development or human development or inner growth needs to be accessible to all people because all grown ups or many of the grown ups vote. Many of the grown ups influence kids, families, communities. And if we are to face the global challenges, we need human growth on a systemic level for all. And last but not least, there is a lot of money spent on leadership programs that is not grounded in good theory or science or methods. The money we already spend, we can spend them much better if we collaborate with the academia, if we evaluate the leadership development courses and make sure that they have an effect. And to truly also find the most effective, the most wise ways of working with that 
And of course, recruiting the leaders who already have the skills. We have a lot of people who have many of the IDGs. It's not only about developing new people. It's also about making sure that people at the senior positions have the skills we collectively <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan, for giving us that background to the IDGs. And of course, there's more to read on the website, www.inthedevelopmentgoals.org. Uh, now I'm very pleased to hand over to the resident representative of the UNDP in Costa Rica, and that is Mr. Jose Vincente Troya, who's going to tell us why is the UNDP involved in this? We all know that UNDP is the main organization when it comes to driving the sustainable development goals, but why, are, why is uh, the, that work going to, why does, uh, uh, is it necessary to work with awareness-based system change in order to reach the SDGs? Over to you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, um, Roberto. It's great to have Costa Rica being the host of this co-creation of the manifest. But let me start saying or asking why Costa Rica is the place to start co-creating the IDGs manifesto. Because this country is blessed by the exceptionality of its nature. This is a surprising space in Mesoamerica because nature, nature has allowed herself to whim of being traveled by a celestial river, Rio Celeste, it is said in Spanish, a place where the moon believes that she is the sun and listen to me well, where jaguars meet the sea. Imagine a jaguar walking on a beach where the sea and its waves are the canvas where the silhouette of the big cat is drawn. I am a citizen who comes from a land of jaguars, but have had never heard of such an occurrence in nature. In short, I'm talking about a country where it is possible to redefine the world, the word amazement. A country that inspires us and gives us the privilege of resuming a respectful conversation with nature and people. A nation that makes it possible to restart a dialogue with the green, blue, orange, and purple economies. With its landscapes and ecosystems, and primarily with its society and their people, the diversity of their people people from a very exceptional country where there has been no army for more than seven years and where the bar is so high that its people often wonder, how can we live up to the legacy we have received? And these same people are showing us that a powerful climate action and an inclusive decarbonized and sustainable green recovery is not only possible, but food takes place in very few short, in the very few short, in the very short term. This is a country showing us that it's imperative to break up false dilemmas such as either we prioritize development or we dedicate ourselves to climate actions or alleged trade-offs between or protecting nature or protecting people. A nation which has identified that dismantling stereotypes and demolishing false beliefs is the beginning of the road for embracing the wholeness required for reconnecting with nature and people. Start, starting to earn, learn what is known is part of the task, allowing us allowing us mental licenses to transgress. This country is enabling the adoption of a new creed where climate action is development, conserving nature is prosperity, creating protected areas is increasing resilience and mental health. 
and even more daring, protecting forest space and pays well. The highlight, this highlights the way Costa Rica is addressing the link between the destiny of the planet and the well-being of people. Costa Rica has endorsed and taken for some decades now a development path that we consider clear, decisive, inclusive, and innovative, inspired by the environmental sustainability and the urgent need to put women in all their diversity at the center of accelerating the Agenda 2030. This country has taken the challenge of transforming its economy, reducing pollution and generating community resilience mechanisms that have allowed it to contribute to the reduction of environmental pressures and to position a green model which can generate greater prosperity, equality, and healthier life. These actions are recognized by the UNDP Human Development Report 2020, where Costa Rica is the country that rises the most in the Human Development Index when adjusted by the planetary pressures. In total, it raises 37 positions and is ranked as the country with the highest ranking in Latin America and number 25 globally. This is a country that allows us greater self-awareness and development a long-term orientation and visioning such as the one we shared in one of our staff meetings in UNDP in Costa Rica when I proposed my team to pause and start an inner reflection on the following dream. Let's travel 30 years into the future. I told them, we're in Costa Rica in the year 2050, surrounded by our daughters and granddaughters, enjoying a friendly sunset in a forest where the sound of the stream and the sound of the birds are heard and the splendor of landscape blesses us and suddenly the smallest of the great granddaughter says, Grandma, Grandpa, what did you do in your time in the 20s so that we can now in the 50s enjoy this moment of the splendor? This is Costa Rica, and this is why Costa Rica is the place to start co creating this manifesto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Troya, for those kind words. Um, we have a lot of people that we're going to speak to today, and uh, so we are going to be tough, be a bit tough on time so we firstly let's move it to a pan over to a panel of people who have decided to invest their time and money into uh, uh, human flourishing and inner development and i would like to hand over start with thomas bjorkman who is the founder of ecfarad foundation also uh, of uh, 29k perspectiva and many other organizations Good afternoon, Thomas. Very nice to have you with us here today. Um, Thomas, why do you think it's so important to, to support inner development in this world? Mm. So um, uh, my foundation, the Ekfredit Foundation or the Oak Island Foundation has been active in Sweden for more than 10 years now, supporting inner development, both in young people uh, and in adults. And we have, every from the start, had a focus on the relationship between inner development and societal change. Um, and I would like to tell you uh, two things uh, around this connection between inner development and societal change. Uh, one, is, one of them is that we, we have a tradition in Scandinavia which is today uh, largely forgotten, but it is a very tangible tradition from 100 or 150 years ago, when all the Scandinavian countries were the, amongst the poorest, non-democratic agrarian societies in Europe. And then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, we were all at the top of the the richest, the happiest, the most stable industrial democracies. And of course, th this had many reasons. Uh, but one reason, and a very often forgotten reason, was that we, back then, 100 or 150 years ago, 
had some very visionary intellectuals and politicians who knew that in times of rapid societal change, it's just so easy for us humans to want to have an external authority to hold on to, hold on to a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But these politicians and intellectuals, they did not want to be authoritarian leaders. They wanted to empower a lot of people in the Scandinavian countries to actually become co-creators of the new modern world. And they knew that in order to do that, they needed to increase the inner capacities and the inner skills of a lot of people to actually be able to shoulder uh, this uh, challenge. And for the country, with uh, Jan's words earlier, to really put human growth at the center of our society. And to, with Robert Keegan's words, to make our society into a deliberately developmental society. And the way we did this 100 years ago was that we created educational centers almost like retreat centers out in nature, where young adults in their early 20s could later on with full state subsidy spend up to six months in retreat with the expressed aim of cultivating inner capacities like the inner development goals in order, of course, to help themselves to a successful life in modernity but also, and not the least, to be able to support the societal transition into a new society. And when this was at its height, almost exactly 100 years ago, then 10% of each young generation in Scandinavia had the opportunity to participate in one of these six months retreats. And of course, that created what we today would call a critical mass in society. So that's the first thing I would like to tell you about uh, the history of, of the Scandinavian countries and how we back then tried to become deliberately developmental societies. The other thing I want to tell you is that today uh, I still think that having these centers out in nature where we can connect to ourselves, to society and, and to nature is perhaps the best, best way to promote inner development and the inner development goals. But that's fairly expensive. And today we have the blessing of technology as well. That is what is making this international call possible. And the foundation 29k.org in Stockholm is a nonprofit open source initiative to use a digital platform to support the growth of these inner capacities, the inner development goals, and to make this available free of charge to many thousands of people in, in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and exactly on, the, on time also. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker in, the, in this panel is um, Andrew Sarazin, who is in Bahamas, I understand. Uh, good morning, Andrew. Yes, good, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to join you all today uh, to celebrate, I think, what is you know, a critical milestone in shifting the perspective on, on development um, and on building a community across research, practice, and policy. Um, I'm the president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation uh, based in the Bahamas. I'm actually in New York City right now, uh, so it's a bit of a, bit of a change, but um, um, I think, uh, I think one of the um, other things that, that, that bring us here today is this sense um, that we are living through a great disruption, a time of change, a time when we've all asked ourselves some really fundamental questions about our lives, um, individually and collectively, um, where we've questioned the bedrock of our civilization. Uh, what does justice and sustainability and truth and progress really mean? And for us at the Templeton World Charity Foundation, that um, uh, the, the question is, uh, how can we flourish, not just survive? Uh, these are essential questions for life uh, with implications um, about our lives. Uh, I think one other 
um, aspect that makes this approach, which I think is very much shared by the interdevelopment goals, is that the focus on how progress is made is as important or more important than what progress is achieved. So just for example, um, gender equality and food security are driven by empowerment and agency and freedom. Uh, justice and <coughs> are fueled by, by uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. Mental health and well-being is supported by our innate capacity for spirituality and faith. Um, action on climate change is accompanied by the virtues of humility, wonder, and gratitude. I loved the reminder from our, our colleague, uh, Mr. Troya uh, from UNDP, that you know somehow the destiny of the planet is it deeply intertwined with uh, our human de destiny. At, for me, the call to action is that despite the importance of these questions, of course, um, it's this approach is woefully neglected. Um, the, put simply, the world's best minds are not focused on these issues, the way in which we cultivate inner capacities and connect them to action on the sustainable development goals. And so that's our mission at the Templeton World Charity Foundation uh, to address this gap, uh, gaps in research, in policy, and in practice. Uh, and we've de dedicated um, at least $60 million over the next five years to building this community. Um, this is a new field in some sense that unites thinking, innovation, and action. And I guess I'm just going to leave you with, with sort of two uh, pieces of follow-up, and, and I'll post them in, in the chat. You can visit our website at templetonworldcharity.org. Uh, earlier um, this year, we published a working paper uh, that has many of the same characteristics uh, using the framework of the interdevelopment goals and uh, connecting that to achieving some, some of the specific sustainable development goals. We had run a global call for ideas in 2020 that received submissions from over 500 uh, teams in over 350 institutions around the world. This was called the Grand Challenges for Human Flourishing. We've now made many of those submissions available as part of a database. So you can also navigate to that database and just see what people are thinking. It's very much my belief uh, that just as we had a revolution in global health uh, and development over 20 years ago, that this um, focus on inner capacities that to achieve human flourishing uh, is the start of a community that will help accelerate the, the attainment of the sustainable development goals. So thank you very much. Uh, for joining you all today. It's my uh, deep pleasure to find like-minded partners out there. So thank you very much, Alyssa, back to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And we are very happy and proud to have you as a partner in the global outreach of the Inner Development Goals. We're going to finish this panel with foundations and investors with a person who has been very instrumental in the development of the IDGs and who is now also the founding partner of an organization called the Inner Foundation. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Osa. It's great being here, and I feel hum really, really humble and honored to see all of you here. Many friends from, from developing these goals together, uh, but also many new ones. Um, and I think that with the inner development goals, we get a direction. We get a direction for the healing and thriving of us as humans. And the inner development goals give us a direct direction and bring forward the capabilities we need, as Jan was saying. And with them, we can grow skills to restore our connections and our relationships and the connections to ourselves, our communities, society and planet. And I think why this is so important is because all over the world right now, we see how people are struggling, struggling with the mental health challenges and inner well-being. And we see globally, we see symptoms of anxiety, depression. We can see how these have doubled during the pandemic. And according to WHO, depression is now one of the leading causes of disability and suicide has become the second leading cause of death among the 15 to 29 years old. And I really think it's time for us to address this. And I think with the inner development goals comes a possibility. 
Um, and I think that children and the young adults, they have to cope with this world. And we see this and we see how the, you know, they're affecting the mental health um, and their feelings of lost, feeling lonely. And, and the numbers of young adults feeling disengaged are frightening. And I think now with this, it's time for us as leaders, cross sec sectors, cross workplaces, cross education systems, and parts of building this society, the infrastructure of society. It's clearly, um, it's clearly now that we have to, all of us, take our responsibility and be um, activating a global immune system to restore our connection and our relationships. And to do this, I think the inner development can go, or the inner development goals can serve as inspiration and a direction to unlock the potential of every human being. And I think for us to do this is for us to include everyone, not just to do that for the selected few, but also, you know, really for the forgotten, forgotten many. And I think picking up what Thomas is saying, how do we do this now? What, what is the elements for us succeeding? And I think let's let us all together now spread the knowledge, the inspiration with the capabilities we need to heal and thrive. I think we need to support the entrepreneurs, the intrapreneurs, cross sectors to openly share their interventions that works in their local communities, at workplaces, how, how we can grow as humans. And I think it's about creating these brave spaces for where people can feel safe, um, be brave to openly see and share the reality as it is, and address solutions that is needed for themselves, their community and the society. And I think working from a place where the, I, I see you're not doing like this also. <laughs> Give me one second to finish up. Uh, working from a place where the whole human can be present and can allow us to unlock our, our hidden potential. Um, so the brave spaces I think we all can create, I think looking at how we can openly share, open source, openly share these interventions. And I think if I end then with Ervin Laszlo saying, you know, if we're part of each other, we're part of a larger whole. So let's use the inner development goals to restore our disconnection and restore our relationships. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, you were not supposed to see that, uh, but thank you for those very inspiring words. Uh, we're, not going to, we're not going to move back to San Jose in Costa Rica, and uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Su Excelencia, Senora Maria del Pilar Caído, who is the Minister of Planning, uh, which is the ministry uh, responsible for working with the Sustainable Development Goals. Over to you. Costa Rica is muted. <laughs> so good morning again, and uh, it is an honor for us to participate here with you. And uh, it is, we wanted, uh, we're very highly committed with this IDG journey, and we believe this is going to be progressive and transforming for our country too. This is going to enable us uh, to, to do better in terms of, of building those connections and relations with other sectors, like for instance, the public sector with the businesses and the civil society, and how to be uh, based on those principles of openness and learning how to build up together in this idea and how to start bridging and accelerating change and transformation and start feeling this truly ecosystem, which is what we wanted to do with uh, the SDGs, which we believe we have been succeeding, still have some gaps to build upon, but uh, we believe we have been moving forward. And with this IDG framework, we believe this is just the, the blank space that we actually needed in order to accelerate this uh, mind mindset and become uh, better in terms of, of connecting each other and working together in a direction and building up on skills and capabilities that are needed in order to accelerate uh, this uh, welfare 
uh, and this need to become better and to do better in the what the sustainable development goals have been teaching us in terms of building up uh, a community of practices and well-being and also uh, moving forward in terms of what we're cap capable of doing if we join forces together so we're very much excited uh, to start this journey and we believe that this is going to be truly transformational i won't lie it would be a major challenge to implement it across the public sector but i believe it's going to be worth it and uh, i just wanted to invite other people and other nations to join us too so that in 2022 more nations will be part of it and then we could actually build it more upon the experiences on what nations and countries can do with this idg framework uh, i believe uh, if we practice them together if we fully embrace it then we're going to see transformation all across uh, what the world and across our own country and uh, we're fully committed to it and again and we want to thank everyone who has been part of it my team and also and also the different foundations and also uh, the importance and support that we have been getting from all of you uh, in this in this uh, area and so thank you very much and we look forward to continuing learning building up upon this and uh, becoming hopefully leaders of this IDG framework uh, once again, as we have been doing with SDGs too. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, congratulations on being the first country, very brave to start to be the first country to take on this framework for accelerating the work with the SDGs. And of course, we all hope that many countries will follow. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce a special guest that's joining us today, I think from New York, and, and that is Mrs. Ulrika Modir, who is the United Nations Assistant Secretary General and UNDP Director of External Relations and Advocacy. Good morning, Ulrika. How are you today? Good morning. No, I'm fine and uh, really inspired also uh, listening to this and of course congratulating Costa Rica for once again being a leading example among our member states and uh, also representing UNDP. It's, it's also of course great to see that UNDP is accompanying this journey of Costa Rica to see how we can connect the work that we do on system solutions in relation to SDGs in many countries moving in reverse, uh, but uh, with that connection that we can make also to the motivation of people uh, to find system solutions to the many challenges that countries face, I think we can move forward instead of in reverse. And uh, it's, it's always great to have examples of that, like Costa Rica is, is showing us today. Thank you very much, Ulrika. Now you, uh, you were part of the MindShift conference with the Inner Development Goals we had in last May, and uh, UNDP works to eradicate poverty and reduce inequalities uh, through the Sustainable Development Goals um, in more than 170 countries. And we all know that there are many specific and tangible problems in the world, and I know that you're working hard to address all of them. Uh, why do you believe it's important to, to work with inner dimensions, uh, uh, such as the inner development goals that are, are pointing at? Well, so I think that uh, many of the speakers already have put forward why it is important. And uh, I believe we are heading towards a lot of uncertainty. This is what we see as we also uh, follow up on the sustainable development goals. We live in a world with uh, uh, the climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, but we have also, as UNDP accompanied uh, countries, uh, throughout and, and still, of course, doing that, uh, the pandemic uh, with the looming socioeconomic crisis that many countries face and will continue to face way beyond uh, that we have perhaps hope and hopefully moved out of, of the crisis. Uh, and then we have a world with an increasing number of increasingly protracted crises and conflicts. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And as I alluded to previously, we need to look for system solutions, but in order not to uh, be completely, uh, you know, uh, 
in order to find hope and, and to find those connections, uh, we all of us also have to work uh, with uh, the connection to the understanding of, of these system solutions. And that is why the inner development goals are important and why we have also worked as the agency being asked to lead on the integration of uh, these system solutions in the United Nations development system. Uh, we have worked not only with our staff, but also staff across the UN agencies to make sure that we can also offer uh, safe spaces and, and the understanding what it means to actually uh, understand the reality and this uncertain world that we are facing uh, as development practitioners. Thank you, Ulrika. Now, most of the world's in low income countries are struggling the most with sustainable development goals. and. Um, if those low income countries do not get access to the opportunity to develop their inner development goals, such as Sweden can and Costa Rica can, um, is there a risk? There is a risk that the, the gap will widen. And um, what do you think could be done about this? So I think that this may be a perception that we have, but uh, I also want to mention that the sustainable development goals, they are really also a set of values really enshrined in the charter of the UN with the pillars that we have on peace, on human rights and development. And I think many on this call would know that in the most conflict ridden settings, we have people carrying those values forward and turning them into action in a way that we perhaps not see in some of what we sometimes call the more developed countries. Of course, the past months we've been accompanying uh, the people of Afghanistan. And I can tell you that uh, in the regions, in the communities, we have a lot of people carrying forward that kind of resilience that is being brought by uh, the understanding of, of, of the values of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we see a leadership in crisis settings in the least developed uh, economies that we sometimes don't see. So the, I think that this is also important, uh, an important reminder. And here's of course why the UN is a unique platform because we can connect people uh, in different realities, uh, but that still share uh, the same values and uh, we can be inspired from each other. Uh, both, of course, countries that have the opportunity <clears throat> to have these kind of, of reflections, uh, but also be so inspired by the leadership that we see in some of the most difficult circumstances across the world. I'm so glad you're bringing that up, Ulrika. Myself, having worked in, in, as you know, in many parts of the world, I, I have learned so much from the people I've worked with in, in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And uh, uh, some of these people, that's also what we're trying to do in this uh, global outreach to ensure that we can learn from the practices that are used in other parts of the world to develop these inner development goals. And um, it's not done exactly how it's done in Sweden, for instance, and that's why we really need to bring that perspective in and um, bring people on the board of the IDG who are also coming from completely different parts of the world. Now, speaking of values, I know you lead a very, very big organization and um, you know that I'm, I, 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 was, um, I could overhear some locker talk when I was at the wedding in India and um, people spoke about you very highly without having an idea about me listening uh, as a good leader. Now, I'd like to know who are the leaders that have inspired you personally uh, in your own in developing your own leadership style and your own inner development goals. So one thing I would like to mention is also the importance, uh, I believe, as we look for system change uh, to really also uh, look at ourselves and who we are. Uh, even though we are leaders in professional organizations or in the private sector and so on, uh, I think our own understanding of who we are in relation to the system change that we want to seek is incredibly important. I mean, I'm a leader in UNDP, but I'm also a consumer. Uh, I'm a leader in UNDP and I'm also a mother. So I think when we look at uh, uh, models with regard to leadership, we also need to look at models that are out there in society to understand societal change. And, and they are to be found among uh, people in our daily life, of course, you know, who really uh, uh, fight racism in daily uh, life conversations, who stand up uh, for rights of people, uh, who uh, 
push back on, on disinformation and misinformation online and so on. But they are also then to be found uh, by, by the senior leaders uh, who connect the dots and, and uh, who see then how we can turn the interest of, of consumers movement, for instance, into system change uh, legislation at country uh, level and so on. And of course, as the UN, what we want to do is to be that bridge and, and really share experiences at the global level. Uh, one example, I mean, we've worked with coalitions as the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, uh, which is an example of, of that kind of connection between consumer uh, engagement and interest uh, uh, towards legislation and, and systems change that needs to be uh, made. I, I get inspired by many people uh, on an everyday basis. I try to be a good listener because that's the best way to, to learn and improve as a leader. Um, and to have inclusive leadership is key, I believe, uh, to make change happen. So as I said, there are so many leaders to be inspired by out there. Uh, it's, it's just to, to look for them and you'll find them everywhere. Thank you, Ulrika. And uh, I really appreciate that you brought up the listening. Otto Scheimer, who's been a, a person that's been very more involved in this work, as you know, uh, has, ha, he said that listening is probably the most underrated leadership skill in the world. Uh, so I couldn't agree more. Now, there's a question from the, from the chat here uh, to you. Uh, question to Ulrika Modea. What is the major challenge to increase mindfulness globally? Million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the one to answer. Uh, but I do think uh, uh, that we uh, have, and of course this initiative is, is really key for that, to, to find time. Um, Many times we are running uh, for uh, solutions, and but we are also caught in a lot of processes. Uh, and maybe in this very uncertain and disruptive time, as also previous speakers have spoken about, uh, the most important thing besides listening uh, is, is really to, to kind of take a step back and, and look at the broader picture. Uh, so this is what we try to do. And I would really like to invite you also, uh, we have a team looking for these system solutions, the integrated solutions, not only for UNDP, but really as an asset for the international community. Uh, take time as well uh, to look at our website. Uh, uh, if you look for integrator and um, integrated solutions at, at undp.org. Uh, and, and you will see how we work also to, to really also make time for reflection in our own teams, but also uh, through our partnerships. Uh, we need to take a step back uh, and, and, and look at uh, what's happening in a very disruptive and uncertain world and where we can find the key solutions. Uh, and, and I believe also find the energy also um, because of, of the uncertainty that we face, it's, it's important. Mm. Thank you, Rika. Now, finally, um, you know about the in the development goals. What do you think is the most important in the development goal or ca human capacity uh, in order for leaders, uh, top leaders in the world to collaborate on the global challenges? If you would mention one, I know that's very difficult, but if you would. Well, I think it's, it's actually the reminder about the origin of the sustainable development goals. I think the sustainable development goals are fantastic, uh, but they were brought forward by decades of, of understanding and growing understanding how economic, social and environmental sustainability needs to be connected and how we need to understand that interconnectivity. Uh, so, and, but I can also tell uh, that sometimes we, we want to focus, we want to, to, to make that kind of division, what's the most important goal and so on. So I think all of us in this community understanding the connection between the understanding of the world and the complexity of the world need also to remind others about uh, the system of the sustainable development goals, because that's the only way that we can get back on track and move forward. So uh, once again, look for system solutions and, and we will be able to make change happen, but also connected also with the values. And that's why I believe the IDGs are very important. Thank you very much, Ulrika, for joining us this morning for you, afternoon uh, for us. And we continue, we look forward to continue dialogue with you and with the UNDP. Thank you. 
at your service. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now um, to um, a number of researchers and academic experts who will give us um, an explanation or give their view, share their view on uh, how we really can work to develop these in the development goals. And the first panelist I would like to welcome is Mr. Dan Siegel, who is a researcher in interpersonal neurobiology at the Mindsight Institute and UCLA. And now the question to you, Dan, is how can we train our brain to become, you know, to make the world a better place? to become more compassionate and uh, be better at changing perspectives, etc. Good morning, by the way, Dan. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be here with you and with everyone. Um, this question that we're addressing of inner development goals and you're bringing up the brain is so fascinating because in many ways, when we think about systems change, for thousands of years in indigenous cultures, there's been systems thinking and a deep way of studying the nature of reality. Uh, in contemplative practices, also for thousands of years, there's been this remarkable finding that when we do take time to reflect and, ret and retreat into our inner lives, we come to realize that the mind is not just inside of the body. It's certainly not just inside of the brain, but it's actually broader than the body, broader than the brain. It's extending throughout our relationships with other people and throughout all of nature. But in modern times, what some people say is derived from Western thinking and Western science, there's a kind of separation that's been built into what we think the mind is and from that mind, uh, we actually get a self. So the way I would respond to this question about what does the brain have to do with systems is to say that the human brain is involved in creating cultural messages. And in a Western derived way that we'll just call modern culture, the mind has created a separate self that has defined the body as a unit, an entity, like a noun, that has its separate existence. And in that construction of a self by the mind that is mediated by certain networks in the brain, what we have is a self-reinforcing, literally reinforcing separate self notion. So interestingly, what I'm gonna to present to you is the notion that the mind's construction of a separate self is in fact the source and the worsening factor for all the pandemics of uncertainty we face, the viral pandemic of COVID-19, the pandemic of social injustice, of misinformation and polarization, even the pandemic of attention addiction for those of us privileged to have these devices and the pandemic of environmental destruction. So, in this sense, then when you look at the IDDs, the inner development goals of being, thinking, relating, collaborating, and acting, what I would ask all of us to consider is that the word self as a linguistic symbol that is standing on top of, if you will, concepts we have and categories is in fact a very serious word if it's interpreted as the individual alone that what we know about the sense of self is it has a sensation to it, a perspective, an agency. And if the self, as we do in modern times, is defined as just the individual, then all of these pandemics will continue. But if instead we allow the construction of a self, which in science, Western science terms is called self-construal, if we allow it to become not just individualized and not just going collectivistic, but to a larger self, a, an integrative self that allows an inner me and a relational we to include not just our connections to people we know, but to all humanity and to all of nature, then we'll realize that it isn't that the individual is a part of a system, it's that the self is the system. 
And when we love the self, we love the system. And the system is all of life on earth. And yes, this is an inner reflective process the individual can participate in, in reflective moments. And it is an inner development goal, but it's taking the word self and expanding it and saying that the amazement of the Rio Celeste that we began this beautiful gathering with today is the awe that expands ourself with gratitude, with compassion and kindness, and with this sense of amazement that in fact, we are the whole system. We are intra-connected, not just connected here to there. So when the brain is capable of receiving these messages in schools and homes, it is possible the research from Western side suggests to expand the self. And that's what I think inner development really permits is to love the system that is all of us together. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. If we love ourselves, we love the system. I like that very much. <laughs> um, now we are going to bring in another uh, expert from the academic world and that is Katarina Hegg who is our uh, who is the CEO of the Stockholm School of Economics Executive Education which is the school that basically produces a lot of the future leaders for the Swedish society and that is for the private sector for the government or for the civil society and the demands have changed from very technical skills to human skills. Can you share some of that with us, Katrina? Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much, Orsa, uh, for that kind introduction. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here. As you said, the Stockholm School of Economics has been part of this initiative from the beginning. So this is something that is very important uh, for us. And uh, you brought up the, the responsibility or the requirements on uh, uh, institutions such as ours. So the Stockholm School of Economics, we are an international business school based in Stockholm, Sweden. And we are, as one of the preeminent business schools, uh, actually, we are educating and developing tomorrow's leaders. We know that upon graduating from our institutions, they quite quickly will have access to important resources and be able to have impact on people and societies. Actually, uh, speaking with the inner development goals, they very quickly move to acting. So we, for a number of years now, have felt that there is a huge responsibility lying on us as educators. We want to make, to make sure that our graduates, of course, have the facts and science-based knowledge and skills they need, perhaps more than ever, when they leave our institution. But we also want to make sure that they grow as humans uh, while they are with us, so that they become increasingly empathetic and self-aware and reflect on their actions. So a few years ago, we adopted an educational mission that essentially aims at integrating the inner development goals in our education. And the acronym for that uh, educational mission is FREE, which also is what we want them to be when they face the challenges that we, that we all need to tackle. Um, but in essence, we want them to be reflective and self-aware. We want them to become empathetic and culturally literate. We want them to be entrepreneurial in a way that they challenge the environments that they're in, that they don't take things for granted, but at the same time, responsible for their actions. So we do this uh, actually through redesigning. We have redesigned our entire curriculum. We have integrated courses on global challenges, on self-awareness. We have launched various tutor programs and initiatives to help and assist them in this uh, journey of, of personal growth also. You know, in a business school context, there are so many temptations as well to be lured into paths and um, uh, trajectories that might not necessarily be what they really want. So we want them to make conscious choices also for, for their own life paths and careers. We have reflection series and perhaps uh, most importantly of all, we have an exhaustive cultural programming. Uh, it is, for the time being, very much based around uh, visual arts, literature, and also sports. 
but we know that this helps them reach heights and depths uh, where just facts and science won't take them. So this is a whole journey we want them to engage in when they join our institution. And all this, of course, is very closely linked and tied to uh, the activities that we do in our research centers on sustainability, on arts, uh, on finance, on accounting, economic sports, etc. So uh, what we hope to achieve is that they make these inner development goals a part of their professional identity. Mm. So when they're not working, they will have this with them and they will also be able to set examples as leaders and specialists. Thank you very much, Katarina, for sharing that with us. Another very prestigious business school uh, that is working with inner development is um, Instituto Centroamericano de Administración de Empresas, based in Costa Rica. And I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Jaime Garcia, my friend from Mexico, who is lead researcher on social progress indicators at the Incae Business School. Welcome, Jaime. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the social progress indicator and why your school is also working with inner development? Hi, hello. It's a pleasure to be with you. And, and well, yes, let me introduce Inkai uh, because we want to be considered more than a business school. Inkai was founded in 1964 and we have a purpose, a social purpose. And that makes the difference because our mission is to contribute to the development of the region. Of course, by forming Latin American leaders, creating knowledge, promoting dialogue and, and cooperation. That sounds easy, but that's not easy given the challenges of a region. Remember that we are in the middle of the Northern Triangle, in the middle of Latin America, which is having an institutional crisis, a democratic recession. So talking about sustainable development, implementing sustainable development projects is not easy. So at the beginning, we start thinking about what to do. And we knew that we require a data-driven strategy to measure and understand complex systems as development. That's why we developed the Social Progress Index to go beyond GDP, to rethink again the success of the countries, of the business, of the cities. And we start measuring nutrition and basic medical care. We start measuring personal rights, inclusiveness, personal freedom and choice, water and sanitation, access to information and communications, health and wellness, environmental quality, using 50 indicators first to measure between countries, but also since, to, since 2014, we start from Mexico to Chile to implement subnational initiatives to understand the difference of social progress and well-being inside the countries. And, and we start generating these projects uh, like to improve better cities in Colombia or the tourism sector in Costa Rica. But at the same time, uh, and given the mission that INCAI has, we understood that the success of the SPI initiatives require, require to go beyond data. We also need to go to the action and the impact. But to do that, we need a new kind of mindset for leaders, for decision makers, for, for practitioners, for the users of the data. Uh, and also we understand that the complexity of development and the value of inclusiveness and sustainability need to be uh, transferred to these decision makers. So we start working with leaders, for example, in the tourism sector here in Costa Rica, we help to develop uh, the national tourism strategy. And we include not only the traditional tourism indicators, but we also put the social progress index, the social progress indicators as one KPI of the tourism sector. So the idea is not to think only about the tourist experience in Costa Rica, but also about the experience of the communities that are receiving the tourism. And we start working with different multi-sector alliances in the different uh, tourism destinations. And of course, the success of this is based in what? Yes, in generating action, based in data, based in these social progress measurements, but also in decreasing the gap between the academic world and the practitioners, using a common language of intervention, improving the traditional mindset that is linked just with economic indicators. And to do that, the development of transformational skills like the IDG framework is key to align actors and institutions, focalize resources, coordinate actions, and increase impact. To that, we link the learning process, this process of changing the mindset, to the real measurement projects that we were doing in the different, in the different countries and places, showing to our partners that we can actually move the needle if we change the way how we define success 
but also how we are defining the, the way we are uh, implementing these projects. So we have tied our applied research and, and SPI measurements with a knowledge transfer process, including gamification techniques, simulations, to improve the skills and abilities of our partners in the management of sustainable development projects, redefining the measurement of success, which is really important for their business, for their sectors, or for the countries. The idea was to go from index to action to impact, which at the end is a driver behind our SPI initiatives and at the same time, help us to achieve our mission. This has been very important in the past, but after the pandemic crisis, this should be a priority, especially in, in the tourism sector. And that's why for INCAI, these initiatives and commitments as, as this one that we are seeing with the government of Costa Rica are a benchmark that should be documented, talked and replicated as a good practice in other countries in order to rebuild the damage of the pandemic and put us back in track for the 2030 agenda. Just, and, and just a quick reminder of how the data can help us to change our mindset. Costa Rica has the same level of life expectancy as Ireland, even though Ireland has eight times the GDP per capita of Costa Rica. So it's not about the money. It's about what can we do in order to increase our success in terms of, of, of social progress and actually of quality of life of the human beings. Muchísimas gracias, Jaime. And we are very, very happy to, to partner with INCAE Business School as well as the Stockholm School of Economics. And another partner organization we are, have in this context is uh, the MIT School, uh, Sloan School of Management. Uh, Mr. Uh, Siegel Dan said that if, we, if you love the self, uh, you will love the system. And if anybody knows things about the system, it's Mr. Peter Senge. Very welcome, Peter. Good morning to you. Good morning. <clears throat> it's a real, uh, needless to say, it's, it's a special honor to be part of this. It's, uh, you know, who knows? You never can tell these things in the moment, but it's possible we look back uh, a few decades in the future, we'll see this as a pretty momentous moment when a country really steps forward and says, no, the inner development is, in my words, I would say, not separate, cannot be separated, and only dangerously separated, separated from the outer yeah, development. The in many ways, that's the, uh, the kind of real message to all of this, right? Um, we've kind of lost, lost track of that over the last, well, probably a few centuries in different paces in different parts of the world. But if you go back to the kind of the scientific roots of the industrial revolution and the growth of Western science, there was a very conscious choice made. If you remember Descartes' famous letter to the Pope, actually, in which he said, you know, the inner world, Ray uh, uh, Colgens was the Latin term, is yours. The outer world, re extensa, is ours. We Western scientists won't, oh, you of course use the term Western scientists, but we scientists will leave that uh, inner world to you, the church. And this was a brilliant political strategy because he didn't want to have happen to him and others in his uh, lineage that what had happened to Galileo. So there's a very explicit move in the development of Western science to focus externally and ignore the internal. And we're all still kind of living under the long shadow of that. And that in turn, of course, very much shaped the, I would say, excessive materialism of the industrial model of growth. It all became about what you can make and what you can earn and obviously what you can accumulate in terms of material possessions. And at some level, I'm sure all of us have always been uneasy about that because we're human beings first, we're not consumers first. So we know at some level, there's something profoundly out of, out of balance with this. So in many ways, it seems to me that what we're doing right now is trying consciously to shepherd a formal as well as informal recognition that no, it's time to heal. It's time to bring back into the center of our cultures, the wholeness of being a human. As Dan was pointing out, Dan Siegel, that, you know, yes, we have a body, but to think that I am my body is the first air that humans make. 
there's a wonderful image that a lot of the native peoples in my part of the world here in New England have that the dying process is, is unrobing, disrobing, taking the robe off. It's this very simple and powerful image to recognize that, no, I'm not a body, I have a body. And at some point that body has done what it's going to do and we let that go. Um, so one of the more poignant conversations the Dalai Lama had with the scientists supported by the Mind and Life Institute over many, many decades was a beautiful conversation about dying in which he asked the scientists, I really always want to understand how you understand death. And there's this very beautiful pause. It's a, in the context where a lot of people have worked a long time to build a, a real container, as we would say, or a space for this conversation. And, and the scientists say, well, yeah, you're right. We really don't understand. It's sort of like a light switch goes off. So I'm just using this to illustrate. When we fragment the inner and the outer, when we act as if you know we are our body and acquiring whatever this thing physically needs is what it means to progress, to have a good life, to be healthy, to be happy. We, we do extraordinary violence to our lived experience as human beings. It's not surprising that sooner or later that violence done to our lived experience will manifest in more and more diverse ways externally. So in a way, for me, this journey is very simply to recognize that no, we simply cannot achieve the sustainable development goals by only looking outside. The outside and the inside are simply no more or less than two facets of our lived experience, our systemic experience as humans. Um, when we use the word systemic, we can make the exact same mistake. We can only look at all the interconnections out there and not realize, as Umberto Maturana used to teach us again and again, all things said are said by somebody. No one looks at the external reality objectively. We are biological entities. We, our awareness, is in, inseparable with what we see as the external reality. So in a way, we're simply making nothing more or less than a small gesture to rectify this deep fissure that has mm -hmm. permeated modern culture. So it's a wonderful moment mm -hmm. to be here and to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for welcoming humanity back home. Um, I feel now very emotional and um, uh, it's going to be impossible for me to sum this whole session up. Um, fortunately, it is not my job to do it. <laughs> uh, I'm giving that job to um, the chair of the Inner Development Goals, uh, Mr. Simon Arnholt, who is also the founder of something called the Good Country Index. And nobody can do that better than you, Simon. Over to you. What can I do? What, to put it another way, what can I do? I'm unfashionably optimistic. And one of the reasons why I'm optimistic is because this is the question, or these are the questions that I hear more and more often these days. Almost wherever I go, whoever I speak to, I either hear, what can I do? Or what can I do? And of course, the answer is already there in everything that Peter said and Dan said and everything else. The problems that surround you as an individual are the same problems that surround us as a species. And the resolution of your problems are the same as the resolution of our problems. But there isn't a simple single answer to the question, what can I do? And I think there's a tendency in our modern age to allow people to believe that goodwill is enough. Mm -hmm. Just to want to make things better, just to be interested in making the world work is great, five stars. But the interesting reality is, of course, it's an incredibly difficult question to answer. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. To set the world to rights requires a highly sophisticated set of highly developed skills. But that doesn't mean that learning how to fix the world is a burden. It's a privilege and a pleasure because in learning these advanced skills, we become so much better. 
to the extent, it sounds like a joke to say it, but fixing the planet and fixing the world is almost a side benefit of what we get when we start to explore some of these inner realities and we start to think consciously and systematically about improving ourselves. So we're incredibly grateful to Costa Rica for being the first, for, for daring to support something new, for believing in these important things. But perhaps more than anything else, I'm grateful to Costa Rica for not being boring. There is a great tendency for countries and especially their governments to be boring. And you can understand why, because they're dealing poor people every day with the lives and livelihoods of millions of people. And that's an incredibly serious subject. And the tendency therefore is to show your seriousness by being boring, by being very serious and never doing anything that's never been done before. And this is of course the most irresponsible behavior for a government that you can possibly imagine. Because if you only ever do and say the things that have been done before, by definition, there will be no progress. So Costa Rica is one of my favorite four or five examples of a country and a government that's finally understood. You mustn't be boring because if you want to connect with humanity and you want to make the world work better, the last thing you can afford to be is boring. Countries are so important in this equation and in the job we're trying to do here because countries, whether we like them or not, the international system, the nation states, they're the way that the seven, eight billion people are organized. <clears throat> and if we want to marshal those seven or eight billion people into useful and productive activity, then the nation states is one of the frameworks that we have to work with. And of course, corporations who directly control the lives, arguably, of even more people than nations do. We need to organize this on the largest possible scale. And that's why it's so very, very important that Costa Rica, as several people have said, should be only the first of a long, long stream of countries who understand that this is a good thing to do. Now, I did mention before that there's a reward, a side benefit for individuals who pursue these goals. There's also a reward for countries who pursue these goals. And that reward simply is the gratitude and esteem of the world's population. And if that sounds a bit soft, let me just put some data to it. As some of you know, I've been measuring the images of countries uh, for, for nearly 20 years. All countries want good images because all countries know that if their brand is a powerful and positive one, they'll get more trade, they'll get more investment, they'll get more tourists, they will do better. And I've done some more research which asks, what is it that countries have to do if they want to get a good image? And the answer, surprisingly enough, from a database of over a billion data points analyzed over two years, what people want from countries is for countries to be good. They don't care whether countries are successful or prosperous or fast growing or beautiful or powerful. More than that, they care about whether countries contribute to the world outside their borders, whether they're good countries. And one fine, fine way for a country to prove that it has the interests of humanity and the planet at its heart is by recognizing that the way forward for all of us is by having citizens who are developed internally, who are part of that general consciousness. So Costa Rica is doing exactly the right thing at exactly the right moment. It'll be even better when we have another 20 following straight on afterwards. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I couldn't have put it better myself. And let's all be good countries and not be boring. Uh, that, that's a very good signal from you. Um, I would like to thank everybody who's been uh, contributing to this uh, very magic moment. All the speakers that have been speaking in this uh, session, all the participants that have been putting up lots of questions. I think, I hope, wish we could put them all forward. Um, all the people who you do not see, like Magnus, like Johan, like Fatima, uh, like Anton and Maria Teresa, who've been work working very hard in the preparations of this event. And before I hand over back to Costa Rica, where the actual signing of the letter of intent and manifesto will take place, so don't miss that. Uh, I'd like to quote um, a famous Swedish person called Dag Hammarskjöld, who says, for all that has been, thanks. For all that will come, 
Yes. And now over to you, John, and your team in Costa Rica. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, I would like first to, to invite both of you to just give some reflections. How are you feeling right now? You've seen the one and a half hours. And then I'm going to say a few words about what we are intending to sign. And then we're going to go into the signing uh, procedure. And those who want can stay, stay and watch. Uh, so first. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm feeling very happy about the decision we made, and I am feeling very excited and very optimistic that this is actually going to be transformational for our country. Just one quick thing, um, when, when we think about the cosmovision of our indigenous population, it, this, it was based on, on, a, on a sphere, it was based on the idea of wholeness, it was based on this uh, common idea that we all share the same uh, connection based on, on our human our common humanity, but it also was linked to us being a part of that shared uh, humanity, but with an ecosystem, with nature too. We were one, all of us one uh, in, the same, in the same world. So this is based on the idea of sustainability too. And I believe that this, uh, that this framework is also giving a sense that, uh, that public policy, it's also an, an spiritual experience that it has to be embedded into, uh, into very strong values. It has to be based on, on love also, and it has to be uh, that enormous force and passion put into place this shared, uh, shared common humanity and, and spiritual experience put into place to make us reach higher states of, of transformation in our uh, inner development and in the development of a society as a whole. That is how I am feeling, and that is why it's very, it feels very natural also from our very own cosmovision. Yeah, I feel pretty excited, happy, and uh, touched. Touched by those words that were inviting us to, to combine uh, climate action with humility. We need to be humble in order to, to succeed in connecting with other people. And it's really important to, to have in mind what the indigenous people have in terms of ancestral knowledge. They, they, they are the sources, the primigenous sources of providing wisdom and the, the way forward to continue connecting nature with our souls and with our spirits and bodies. And I also feel very happy because now I see that the IDGs also need an integration. We work at UNDP integrating all the sustainable development goals. The IDGs provide this integration and all of them are interconnected. Really happy, really excited to be part of this initiative, supporting and accompanying Costa Rica. Thank you. So I started with the word hope, and I think I will finish with the word uh, inspiration. I feel inspired by you and your brave moves. Thank you. By the team who has been working with it so hard, 12, 14 hours, days, the last uh, weeks. Um, and also how, how this process started, that it, it was starting with a group of scientists saying, let's not just use our own models and be in our own egos and say, my model is the best. Let's create a model that is shared that more than a thousand people can agree upon. And first of all, it was scientific and practitioners coming together that sometimes is also not working in silos. And then we said, can we bring in companies and can we bring in first small companies and then bigger like Spotify, then like Ericsson, like Ikea, some Swedish companies. And I really want to invite those who are looking and watching, come and join us. We're a growing community of organizations who work with implementing and making the IDGs practical, living them. And then that we hoped and thought that maybe nations can start doing this. And I'm very happy that it's Costa Rica who is the first nation, because when we talk about embodying or living, integrating, 
and we look at what has happened in, with us, I, I, SDGs. We have problems with losing our forests all over the world. And in Costa Rica, just in the last 20 years, deforestation has gone up from 47% to 59%. It's quite an increase for a country in just 20 years. And I think we can do the same thing with IDGs. We can be living examples. We can do our best and be sure that we will be failing also every day because it's a huge task. But to really live the IDGs, we're talking about here in the manifesto, and you have a specific letter of intent also that you're signing, that we will create a program where you will be sending high officials from all the ministries, inviting people to learn more about the IDGs. We're also talking about collaborating more, not working in silos, but between the different ministries. Because if we are to work with the IDGs, we can't do the same mistake and just focus on the inner. We must learn from Peter Senge and the wisdom of the inner and outer. And one of the pandemics I'd like to speak to is the pandemics that we sleep half an hour to one hour too little. We work too much and that does not help us grow our capacities. And in order for us to sleep, we must sometimes maybe regulate the high sounding motorcycles that are in the external world, or we need to have clean air or good food and so on. So we need to really co-create and collaborate and inspire each other. So with those words, I really hope that more countries, more organizations will join. Please uh, check out the manifesto that will be put in the chat. And I welcome you to come and to sign uh, in English and in Spanish. Uh, two versions, so please. Spanish? Yes, please. Yes, please. That's the letter on the So, and we are almost done. And then I think this deserves an applaud. And I would actually ask everybody. Uh, even if you are online, to unmute yourself and if you can allow the participants to unmute them. So we can all applaud the, the signing of first country signing the, the manifest. Maybe we can hold one, one of them each. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Bravo. 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 Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. Felicitations. Also, final remarks from you. Thank you, Jan. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, that was beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the end of the beginning of the IDG as a framework to reach the SDGs in, on our planet, starting with a brave, not boring country, Costa Rica. Uh, I would like to invite you to hang around. Uh, in, for the journalists, there's going to be a link for a press room. And uh, so many websites have been mentioned to you today. Of course, the innerdevelopmentgoals.org, undp.org, and uh, the templetonfoundation.org. Did, did I mention them all? I hope so. Thank you, everybody who was here with us today to celebrate this very magic moment. And um, let's uh, just keep the spirit up. And there is, there is a welcome home to humanity. Thank you. Bye.